Record. All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the M Sister Studios podcast, specifically in our creative content for a cause season one. My name is Danielle Minetti, and I am here with not one, but two very special guests, which I'm super excited to talk with and have a conversation about um, today's topic with. And first, the first person I'd like to introduce is Mr. Joshua Ross. Hey, uh, my name is Josh Ross. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, let's see, I've been uh, been doing martial arts since I was a teenager and um, got into the sword arts uh, just out of college doing kendo. And I did that for five years, um, two of which were in Japan. And then towards the tail end of that five years, uh, discovered a more fully inclusive uh, martial art, of, of, or at least related to what the samurai did, which is uh, Nami Pio, which is what I teach now um, and how I know Ryan. And, <laughs> and so I left Kendo for the world of the, the samurai, um, basically, you know, from, from just doing one kind of modern sport version of it to a more historical uh, mm-hmm picture basically um and then you know a little more about me um yeah you know, well i guess a little more on the martial arts you know a big piece that that brought me to the sword arts is is um kind of realizing that i lacked kind of uh a solo approach to to uh, competition maybe you know um so like I, I played hockey and and stuff to uh junior level in in high school and and noticed that i'd kind of ebb and flow like if the team was doing really good you know i'd kind of do better and if the team was sort of down i'd, I'd sort of flow with the with the team and i picked up kendo specifically because i wanted to um figure out how to d- like control my own um level of input or or you know like try performance i guess right my my own level of performance and then um i think that piece also like slowly led me into really like the mindset um and the philosophy that um samurai used uh, to to kind of approach things which is is i kind of difficult from a modern context to, mm-hmm. to go really understand um in certain ways you know but through through the sword arts and and training i think there's um some connection there that we can get you know and then and then like outside of this i'm a i'm an engineer Mm -hmm. in aeronautics and i work at boeing and um do some flying and and some (laughs) other shit on the side but uh it's kind of the short version all Okay, we'll uh, we'll dive a little deeper into uh, more extensively some of your background and stuff. But next, I want to introduce Ryan. So Ryan, go ahead and introduce yourself to everyone. I think he froze, but that's okay. We'll cut this part out. <laughs> modern technology yeah right everybody i'm ryan uh, uh, i started off in uh shotokan karate um and then i moved on to aikido in my teens and then uh, i moved to san diego uh, around 2002 and i started to learn nami ryu uh james williams 
and I've been doing that since. Um, yeah, I teach uh, three times a week, and yeah, it's just it's a way of life for me now. Uh, just always do it, always done it, and uh, it's gained you know gaining a lot of knowledge, you know, throughout my life, and I love to impart it. Uh, with as a teacher um, and I think the big thing that that brought me to martial arts is I watched a lot of Chambara movies when I was a kid mm -hmm. uh, Chambara are the old samurai flick uh, mm -hmm. Akira Kurosawa movies um, stuff like that uh, I also was like you know 80s lots of ninja stuff was going on um, I was always like uh, into that stuff always watching that stuff and I just always had a meeting with the board really um and when I found uh James in San Diego uh you know and his whole thing was the sword um it really you know set me on a, on a path in my life mm -hmm. uh in my daily life uh I work for Granger uh as a sales uh specialist Interesting. So, um, so both of you kind of have, you know, you do the martial arts, but you also have um, your professional careers as well, which, you know, we might touch upon a really bit, but um, for everyone out there who's listening and or watching today, we're going to do a deep dive into um, martial arts, specifically martial arts that the samurai would use, as well as we're going to talk to these two individuals just about their background what got them into each martial arts or style of martial arts they can they're going to also explain to us a little bit what you know each one is and you know what's the specialty behind those and kind of just how not only teaching it but they implement it into their lifestyle because that's they both mentioned how it pretty much changed their lives so we'll do a deep dive into that as well but first off Again, I like to say both of you, thank you for being on here. I really appreciate um, just ha wanting to help out, um, not only for our pod for this podcast, but you know, for you know what we're trying, big picture, who we're trying to help. Um, and those for those of you that are following our video series, creative content for a cause. What we're doing to sum it up is we're making creative videos leading up to this big you know finale video that's going to deliver a message and for this season we're we're working with the colorado veterans project so at the end of this video you'll see you can go into the description down below you'll see the link learn more watch previous videos where we discuss more in detail what the colorado veterans project is but again at the end of this video click on the links in the description below um, learn more about the colorado veterans project um, as well as the Memorial Day Ruck March, which is their upcoming event. Go, go ahead, donate and tell us, mm -hmm. tell them that M Sister Studio sent you. But I'm a, over my little spiel for that. And first question that I have for both of you is what kind of got you into martial arts? Because I know for myself growing up, you know, it was kind of one of those things that I was like a sports mm -hmm. kid. You know, my parents kind of enrolled me in sports and they thought, you know, trying something a little different. So they threw me into karate and, you know, that world young, you know, I think I was like eight or nine and I loved it. It's just, you know, sometimes you kind of fall off and then you find it again. So for me, this is the time of my life when I'm finding it again. So for both of you, what kind of, you know, when did you start, um, Mar you know, getting into your martial arts and also to what influenced both of you to kind of, you know, start practicing and learning about martial arts. Yeah, you want to go first, Ryan? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I'll go first. Um, so, geez, uh, when I was a, a wee lad, um, <laughs> I would say uh, I, I saw, I don't know, I saw some movie and, you know, there was fighting in it or whatever. And I was always interested in, in what happened there. And um, so uh, luckily enough, I, I, you know, I grew up in a really small town. Um, there wasn't much um, activity other than, you know, you know, little league stuff, you know, little you know, sports stuff. And 
I, I've never been, I mean, I did baseball and I, I played basketball, but I was never really the most um, athletically uh, driven. Um, but with the, with uh, martial arts, like I saw on, on television, I thought that was something I would pursue. And luckily there was a karate school and um, I did that, you know, when I was very young, uh, I want to say like six, seven, you know, very young. Um, and uh, uh, I, it kind of went away, um, you know, in my teens. Um, and then I kind of uh, went back, but I, I started Aikido at that point. Um, and it just wasn't, you know, the, uh, the thing that I was really looking for, you know, because I was always fascinated with uh, the swordsmanship. Um, saw it in, you know, samurai movies. And it, and I mean, that was like, I was like, I was just fascinated by it. And I, I really wanted to, you know, participate in that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, that's, that's how I kind of fell into this, really. <laughs> awesome. Josh, how about you? Um, yeah, so, you know, grew up uh, until I was in junior high in New Hampshire and in, in, in a one horse town, basically. So, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't even know if there was a martial arts school um, <laughs> nearby. But, uh, you know, I remember watching Seven Samurai and, um, and it, it was pretty sweet, uh, old black and white samurai movie, um, you know, and, and I, I think I might have watched that after we had watched the Magnificent Seven with uh, old Western movie, you know, which was based on Seven Samurai. And, and we, were, we were pretty stoked on that and played Cowboys and Indians and everything. And then and I think... Um, probably was like, oh, well, if you like that, you know, we'll go watch the, the, the movie that that's based on. And, um, and so, you know, then we, we got into the kind of sword ninja thing and we used to take these little, um, like round, uh, measuring devices. I, I can't remember what they're called, but I think like plumbers would use them and stuff like wire gauge checkers, you know, mm -hmm. and we, Sharpen the edges of those things. We scored a couple ten of them or something, and we're making them into ninja stars and and whatnot. And we made nunchucks and beat ourselves up trying to look like Bruce Lee or whatever. Um, and then uh, years later, moved out here to Seattle where I am now, and and got into Aikido and did that for about a year, and then kind of you know. Get, fell out of that for, for ice hockey. Cause we did pond hockey growing up and then here there at rinks and, you know, real hockey, et cetera. So we, we really dove into that. And then, um, and then out of college, um, well in high school too, I took Japanese cause I was pretty interested in the, in the culture. Um, and so there's still like a link there. And then out of college, I, I decided like, you know, kind of going back again to that, like, I want to sort of learn to regulate my own performance level, level. And, and that's when I realized, like, man, there's kendo all over Seattle, you know, we have a pretty big Japanese population influence historically, and, and a big connection with Japan and community college and the city and stuff, community colleges in the area and the, and the city of Seattle have like sister cities. So we, um, whatever, there's a pretty big community, you know, so got into kendo, um, did that and then went to Japan and, and, um, was doing kendo there and, and, uh, got like first and second degree black belt when I was living in Japan and, and I'd hang out after class with the old guys. Um, I was like in this little neighborhood dojo where like, I, I was, I ended up teaching the kids eventually and then I'd hang out and like, I was the only like mid, oh yeah, I was like early thirties then, you know? So it was like, it was me and a bunch of like 60 year old seventh, eighth degree black belts. So I basically would just show up and get my butt handed to me for an hour and a half, three days a week, you know, uh, which was great. Um, and then, and then I got into Namidu because one of the teachers of, of Kendo also did Iaido and he was, 
and he kind of got this conversation going where a bunch of the kendo teachers were like, oh yeah, you know, if I had a real sword, I probably couldn't cut anything, you know, like I, like I'm great at kendo, but like the cutting world's different and got me thinking like, you know, what did the samurai do really? Cause it wasn't kendo like only, right. And it wasn't Aikido only. And I didn't know at the time what it, what it was even called and, and then did some research and stumbled into Kenjutsu and then moving back from Japan, I um, moved back like six months after this, um, my teacher up here, Garen Billick had moved up from San Diego um, where he and Ryan were training. And so I, I came back to, to find Namidu and, and Kenjutsu, which has, you know, the, the using a real sword um, and doing also empty hand techniques and, and Tanto and Naginata and everything that the, the samurai would have been been doing. So it like embodied the whole thing. So, you know, it took me about, took me about a, maybe three or four classes to, to drop Kendo and, and move over to <laughs> didn't and take Jutsu much. and <laughs> didn't take much, you know, it was, it was, it, it was definitely spoke to me. You know. <laughs> um, that's that's awesome. Before you know, I ask questions about. Um, I know Josh. For you, you said you lived in Japan, and then Ryan, you said you were training down in San Diego. You both seemed like you both started in the same place, which was Aikido. If you can correct me if I'm wrong, can you explain to everyone what it is and just give your input on to why it just wasn't the martial arts style for both of you? Cause it kind of sounds like you both started similar paths, but then it also too, the similar thing is you kind of found something else that interests you besides where you started. So can you both just explain what it was and then, uh, and what it entails and then why you decided to move on from that? Well, um, I started in karate actually, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. which was, you know, Okinawan, it's not truly a Japanese martial right. art. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, like, it was, you know, it was hard. It's, it's a hard stop, you know, using a lot of force here, you know, using the pendulum motion for punches, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, it's very taxing on your body. Um, mm -hmm. You know, your joints hurt and all that. Um, and then I moved to Aikido because there was the other opposite end of the spectrum. And, uh, you know, uh, it was uh, it had a, a good, you know, it, it, it has a really good, uh, you know, how they, they say what you'll do with it. Um, however, uh, I found that what they talk is not what they're able to do. And um, that's why I'm kind of, you know, gravitated towards James because he could actually do some of the stuff that the Aikido guys were talking about. So, um, you know, seeing uh, somebody able to make people fall down by touching them on the head and you know, do that to you, it, it changes your perspective about what's really going on. Um, and so that's, you know, that was, you know, what sold me um, with, with Nami Ryu um, was actually being able to apply mm -hmm. the technique. Um, and I mean, you get to use a sword. It was, it was a no brainer <laughs> <laughs> for me at least. You know. And, and then Josh, how about you? Um, yeah, so let's see. Well, Aikido, uh, man, when was that? I was like, I was 14 ish, maybe, you know? Um, and that was like, uh, we do that. My, my older brother and me and my mom would, would go to Aikido. And it was, um, I think it was, well, it was, it was fun, but it was kind of like, I think more her thing to sort of bring us to and, and the idea of like, this peaceful flowing together um, and using your opponent's energy. And, um, you know, I think my, my teacher was pretty good. She was a super short lady. Um, 
and it would be interesting to go back now and, and work with her, you know, but um, uh, at least at the time, she seemed like she was able to do stuff, you know. Um, I mean, I, I guess that part never, like, popped in my head, you know. Um, she she could kick my butt when I was a teenager. So, um, <laughs> and then the, like, I didn't go I didn't go back to it because I, um, you know, kind of out of kendo, right? Going, realizing like the samurai did like all of these different, th they were professional warriors, you know? Um, and so they did all these, all these different aspects. And, and that was the part that, you know, at that time I was like really interested in, like, how did they do all these, all these things? Um, and, and how did they bring them all together? You know, because we've like separated stuff out in the modern world into, into like its own little kind of microcosm of stuff. At least that's how I saw it in my head. And then and going to um, <clears throat> Dojo of the North Wind here, which is, is no longer, but uh, it, was, it was a pretty easy sell to go to a couple classes and realize like, man, I can use this stuff immediately in, in Kendo. And then also like, we don't use the Iaito, like the aluminum sword, aluminum, you know, they're, in Iaito they use aluminum zinc swords typically for most practice, which aren't sharp. And it was like, we only use sharp swords to make, you know, there's like no, you know, sharp tantos, sharp, sharp swords, unless we're doing uh, uh, like partner work with a Boken or something like that. And, mm -hmm. and um, there was just a, like a realness um, that I was craving. You know, I don't think I knew it, but, but like once I was exposed to it, I was like, oh yeah, this is like, this is the real deal, you know? Um, <laughs> and so it, it, it was, yeah, I don't know. That, that was kind of a, I think the clincher for me, you know, swords are awesome. So, so that, that's the easy one, but, but it was, it was like the, the realness of like, using a real sword in training and and kind of the the other piece that sort of caught me was like uh okay you know the partner whoever you're do going with like they can never be wrong as part of the philosophy you know as in like the attacker can never be incorrect like you can't be like, oh you cheated or you came i wasn't ready it's like you know so there there was like kind of that attitude also baked into the to the reality situation which which um which I liked. Awesome. Um, so you both mentioned that at some point in time you were living and training in, you know, different areas of either the country or the world. So Ryan, can you explain your experience when you, if again, correct me if I'm wrong, of training in San Diego, right? San Diego. Yeah. Yep. So just explain, you know, how your, what your training was, what led you to San Diego the training, the martial, again, ex going into detail about like the martial art style that you were learning and now implementing just everything, San Diego. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, I was uh, a live-in student um, at the Aikido school here in Reno. So I actually lived at that school and trained there. Um, when I met James, I decided I was going to go to San Diego and learn from him. So, I, I mean, I picked up everything and I, I moved down there and I made it like, you know, my, like my college almost like, you know, it was all I did was, was train and, you know, focus on learning that stuff. Um, Cause I found it so valuable. Um, so, I mean, like, you know, I, I lived in a very small, uh, what they call a granny flat, just off of somebody's house. Um, it's like a small little, uh, there's like one room, there's a bathroom, there's a kitchen. It, it was very small. I mean, it, this was all self-inflicted. I mean, I was, I was young and I had no money. So, I mean, it was all self-inflicted. Um, but, you know, going to the dojo five, six times, you know, a week um, and, and always just always doing it. 
um, that was kind of, you know, that was the teeth that was learning, you know, that was learning. Um, and uh, I mean, it was just, uh, I mean, I could, re I remember like how it was set up at the time, you know, Monday night was uh, kind of uh, like kind of a, a set way because of who was teaching on that night. Like we did a set thing. It was like we did rolls and then we did Roku Donkiri, which is like the six basic sword cuts. Um, and then we did Ikajo, which is first technique in Japanese. Um, it's an arm bar, the standing arm bar. And you had to do it right. Um, and that's the hard part is to do it right. <laughs> um, uh, and then, yeah, Tuesday morning, it was like very um, more like based towards modern um, application. Um, you know, we wore uh, pants and a, and a t shirt. And uh, I mean, it, we always started off with rolls. I mean, that, that was always the first thing is rolls. And then, um, you know, more empty hand, uh, some, some knife work was thrown in. Um, and then uh, Wednesday night was, uh, again, back to wearing the, the Japanese clothing. And it was a different teacher. And it was more fluid. Like, it wasn't, it was just how he felt that he wanted to teach that day. Um, and then Thursday morning was, advanced class and that's just when james would kick your butt you know <laughs> however that was going to be um and then saturday morning was uh the first hour was always uh sword draws um so i mean that was always hair raising saturday morning right a bunch of guys with swords <laughs> don't know what they did the night before <laughs> And uh, um, then it was Kinjitsu, um, and then it was Empty Hand. So, and that was always Saturday. It was it went Ei Jitsu, Kinjitsu, and then Jujitsu. I mean, it was all three. Bam, bam, bam. And it was always kind of the same technique when you look at it um, through our perspective. You're doing the same thing over and over again until you get good at it. Um, and I mean that and just rinse and repeat. I mean, that was that was how I was training for five years in San Diego. It uh it sounds like I mean for you it was, it was probably enjoyable because you were where you wanted to be in terms of training, but it also sounds yeah. very um kind of you know, I don't know if strenuous is the right word because again you were enjoying it, but it sounds like a jam-packed schedule, but it also sounds, you know. There was a lot of, I, you know, I did it to myself. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of sword, <laughs> but it also sounds like there was a balance between um, different Japanese um, martial arts, particularly yeah. like to what the samurais use, which I think is really cool because yeah. I mean, I don't know experience firsthand, but what if, you know, something happened if they don't have their swords or something, then what do you do if you limit yourself? in your training to just one thing then like what happens so it sounds like a very right. well-rounded training school and it sounds like you got over your five-year period you got like a lot out of it and it just sounds like it was just a lot of muscle memory like doing the same things but once you you know you train I know from military experience you train like you fight right so it was just a lot of muscle memory rinse and repeat and it sounds like it worked like really really well and you enjoyed the entire your entire stay in san and diego then, training oh i i think i froze up on there either I, I didn't catch that oh oh no i was just saying um it sounded like i i might be repeating myself but it sounded like you know it was a lot of like muscle memory but you kind of like you're training like how you would fight you know that's like a military yeah. term we have and, you know, a lot of muscle memory and stuff, but it sounded like, again, very well-rounded training school. And, definitely. you know, you sound like you definitely enjoyed it and you just became a better martial artist at, you know, once you were finished training at the school in San Diego. 
um, that. Uh, um, I didn't realize how much better I had become until I went out on my own mm -hmm. and, and started teaching on my own. I, like, cause when you, you're always, you know, with the, the guy, you know, you don't mm -hmm. see how well you progress. You, like, cause there's no belts, there's no, you know, um, hats on the back. It, it's like, no, you're doing that wrong. No, you're doing that wrong. <laughs> it's like, it's a repeated, you know, um, you, you kind of have to have something within you that just, this just what you want to learn. You want, you want the magic. You want to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, that's, that's my experience with it, at least. Like, that's how I grew with it was um, just, I was like, I have to get, I have to get this. I, I have to get a little bit of this. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, when you go out on your own and you realize, wow, I actually learned something. It was it, like, it, I learned just a little though. You know, it wasn't like, <laughs> I was just all of a sudden the best or anything like that. It was just, I was able to perform things that I never thought I'd be able to do. Right. Um, did you ever, cause you said that you, you know, you didn't realize how much you learned until you went on your own. Was there any yeah. like a mental roadblock for you personally when you were training at the school that, cause they were, you know, teaching in a certain style. Was there any point in time you're like, man, like, why am I doing this? <laughs> That's every day. <laughs> I do that every day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> um, is it different now, though, since you are like, you know, in charge of your, your own type of training and teaching others? Is it a little bit different now than compared to back then? Uh, it is different, but, um, you know, I put the same standard um, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, James instilled, you know, um, I, I I want the best, you know, mm -hmm. for my students. I, I think I'm I think I'm a little soft on them sometimes, but <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I I you know I try to you know because I made a lot of mistakes in my training, and I tried to steer them away from that. Um, what I did wrong, which is you know, <laughs> cut yourself and stab yourself a few times, <laughs> but <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> uh you know just just you know jumping in on that like yeah like oh, oh don't do that because i did that and when i did that i bled so uh, <laughs> that, you know that's i think that's how you become a really good teacher is like you make sure that they don't do that mistake that you made mm -hmm. right it sounded like i mean you were, you know, when you were learning, there was a very high bar that you had to, your instructor James made you reach, but now you're like, okay, I see what he was trying to do. I get it. Definitely. You know, I could have, I might have complained at the time, but I get it now. Oh, there's no complaining. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> but that's pretty, that's, um, that's pretty awesome. Um, so during, before you left San Diego, um, was and this is not martial art related. Was there anything else you were doing while you're there? While you were there, instead of um, training. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I just, I, I kind of, I, you know, I was working, making ends meet. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, the shipping and receiving um, clerk for a semiconductor company mm -hmm. um, while I was down there. So I was doing that. Um, and other than that, like, I mean, that was it. That was it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, San Diego is beautiful, but, like, mm -hmm. when you have to work six days a week to make it, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's tough. It's tough. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sounds like you just worked, learned, repeat. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and, like, on Sunday, maybe go take a walk on the beach. Mm hmm Which is not a bad thing. That's not, right a there in San Diego. it's not a bad thing <laughs> so when did you decide to leave you know leave the school 
and kind of go out on your own, which now you're in Reno. Was Reno the first place that you kind of settled down to go out on your own to teach or was there other stops like along the way? No, um, no, I, uh, because most of my family lives up here. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just, I mean, when I, I, I grew up around this area, you know, mm -hmm. I grew up two hours east of here. Um, the small town is called Winnemucca. Um, but I always, you know, loved the, the flat desert and the mountains. And um, so I just kind of, you know, I call it home. You know, I just, uh, but what happened that made me move was there was a big fire in San Diego and I could see it from my bedroom. So I just packed everything up and left. Like I was kind of, you know, uh, I'm worried. You know, I was worried. Yeah. That, like, there wasn't going to be a place to live anymore and whatnot there's more to it than that but like that i mean really the gist of it really yes. okay yeah um we'll go more deeper into like what you're doing now and how you set that up but i want to get to josh so he can talk about what his experience was when he was living over in japan as well as like the martial <laughs> arts he was learning while he was there so josh you're up um yeah so uh you know doing doing <clears throat> i lived in japan two different times um oh, okay. like two years once and then I, I went back for both times for work primarily um but it was like a, a paid vacation in a, in a sense you know um so the like the first time when i was still doing kendo was um interesting to me you know one like having whatever watched you know sam more obviously like the first movie was like seven samurai but there were plenty of samurai flicks after that you know we watched like the american ninja which are all probably just horrible movies really i haven't watched them i have good memories but i'm not going to ruin them um <laughs> smoke bombs and disappearing and all that uh, you know? and then um <clears throat> you know I, yeah the um so, you know, and then doing the language and stuff. So I was super stoked to be in Japan and like uh, the crafts and stuff were, are, are amazing. So I was, I was kind of in my element, you know, and I, I um, found this uh, uh, store that sold kendo equipment and asked the dude there like, hey, is there a dojo around here I could train at? And he like, you know, tells me like there's, you know, Yurinkan Dojo, which is down the road. Um, and back where my Japanese used to be better and went down and it's like whatever the name of the school's li literal translation is neighborhood dojo you know and so I went in and joined up and and um and was super stoked so they had they had class three nights a week and I would go for three and a half hours um each each night and then eventually I I uh, I think I'd show up an extra half hour early to teach the kids um, later because they they sort of kindly rang me into that you know um, and these kids were like you know it's like basically all like maybe five to seven year olds so there's like this giant bearded uh, white guy you know monster in this armor teaching these little kids um, which is which was fun and then. Cause like mostly in between there and like when you're old, you're, you're, you're studying or working all the time. So there weren't, there were a couple people my age that would come and go um, when they, when they could, you know, but um, it was, it was like, you kind of get sucked or I got sucked into the culture of like endless perfection, which I think is like one of the great things of the Japanese culture is like, they, they always try to figure out like, how do I get better? at what I do, you know, um, and, uh, you know, if you haven't watched, there's a movie like, uh, Jiro dreams of sushi, you know, and there's a, this, it's a great movie, but there's a scene in there where the guy talks about going on vacation, you know, and they're like, how was that? And he's like, I just spent the whole week thinking like, I can't wait to get back to work so I can make better sushi, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, there's a, uh, insanity to that and there's also uh, an aspect that's I think is is a great 
great part of that. So like doing the kendo there really taught me like um, for the first time in my life, like what it means to learn and like what it takes to learn something, you know? Um, and I had sort of accidentally done it playing hockey just because I was really into hockey, but I didn't like understand that if you want to be good at something, you just have to do it deliberately and as much as humanly possible and then some, you know? Um, and so that really got me there and then coming back to Seattle, you know, or got me to that learning, learning mindset and, 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 um, and then coming back to Seattle, it was, uh, <clears throat> well, my, my teacher here, Gary Billick had, had, uh, learn he lived in san diego and i i can't remember when he started with james william sensei but um i i think it was like 99 or 2000 uh maybe a little earlier because i must have been earlier because i started with him in 2008 like at the tail end of 2008 and he had been i think training for 12 years before he had moved up here if i remember so he had he had kind of that William sensei uh mindset you know um so we had small classes <laughs> uh but it, it was kind of like drinking from the fire hose but no yeah there was a lot of the same deal you know no <laughs> it's either right or it's wrong basically there's no like oh yeah it's pretty good you know we'll let you kind of win um <laughs> which which works for me or, or at least I can I can handle that kind of learning and I and I saw you know kind of like how Ryan put it like the magic I call it the juju but um and then and so uh, you know it's like man I want that you know and then I I went back to Japan for work and I got um a chance to train with uh, Kuroda Tetsuzan Sensei who is also um has been like William Sensei started learning from him and in the early 90s let's say no 20, 2000 i guess um and he is 92 no 92 so even longer okay yeah maybe i guess it was 20 years 10 years ago you know <laughs> so um and so i went to his his school and he is um you know he's carrying on a lineage of that's been in his family for like 400 some odd years um and and it's actually a couple different styles that have been combined into one one school nowadays uh shimbukan kuroda ryugi and um and so there we did a lot of ei jutsu ei which is drawing and cutting on the sword which you do if you were like a surprise attack maybe or or something like that and kinjutsu uh, which is just how you use the, the already using the sword when it's already out of this out of the saya and then jujitsu um and in you know in both of these things like in both namidu and shimbukan like everything you do is the same principle you know i think we only have like four maybe five movements that manifest in you know an endless amount of techniques basically um but but there's there's something uh, like you know when somebody when like whether it's William Sensei or whether it was Bill like, Sensei or Broda Sensei like when you don't know what the hell's going on but you you're being like thrown to the ground or moved and there's nothing you can do about it because like your brain wiring is fried it um, it either makes people leave because they just don't understand it. Or uh, you're like Ryan and I, who, and we're, you know, it's like, I want the juju. I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to, I need this, you know, I'm going to spend my life trying to figure out how, how to do this. Um, and I think, yeah, anyway, maybe rambling now, but that, 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 that was like a piece of, you know, sort of the day. And, and, and when I lived in Japan, the, the first time for Kendo, I could like walk or ride my, my bicycle, my mama Chetty bicycle, which is like the style, like ladies bicycle with the basket on the, on the front. Um, and then when I went back, uh, Kuroda Sensei's school, Shimbukan was down South by Tokyo. So twice, twice a week, I would, um, 
take the train two and a half hours one way to to go study for an hour and a half or two depending on the day and then head home and and um i had a lot of email at the time so i would work on the train basically responding to a bunch of emails and i get home later and plug in and you know my computer would send send them all (laughs) basically you know so 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 um that was good and then also got a like intermixing with the japanese students and like like um there were a lot of interesting bits of like the samurai the samurai world that were kind of fun to see and 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 hear about you know so okay oh that's uh it sounds like you know it sounds like both times you've been to japan has been almost completely two different experience experiences especially since you were kind of learning different things at both different times the two questions i have for you you first one you both sound like you had a a high bar to kind of hit your original instructors you josh you mentioned that you know you come across the mindset in japan that um they always kind of like try to strive for perfection or more so like try to improve on what they're already doing which i agree with you know if you're not striving to get better every day then i mean i don't want to say what's the point but like what's the point did that yeah, anyway yeah. <laughs> like El ryan said did that anyway was there a day that you're like why am i doing this um yeah i mean <laughs> so uh yeah I, i'm thinking you know it's extremely frustrating Mm-hmm. Uh, um and to to you know um i i don't know that i ever was like oh man this is nuts i'm out of here but um but it certainly has been like i've been really angry like frustrated mm-hmm. to the point of anger because i can't make something work you know mm-hmm. and um and uh so, you know, the, the upside, I think like where, where um, William Sensei is a bit maybe more serious uh, than Kuroda Sensei um, and, and, and even I think uh, Billick's, you know, Garen Billick was a bit more serious too on like a uh, piece out of Japan, Kuro, you know, Kuroda Sensei, he, he goofed around a bit to kind of lighten, lighten the mood, um, which helped me. And he calls, instead of saying frustration in Japanese or, or something like that, or despair, maybe the word comes to mind, you know, he calls it happy pain because <laughs> you know, he knows it's super frustrating. Um, so uh, there, there's a, a piece out of that, that, um, you know, remembering like, whatever, you just got to keep at it, you know, mm-hmm. like it, get there you got to keep at it and and the other thing is like if if william sensei can do it and you know he learned from don on jay and like it's it's and you know crota sensei can do it and some of his students like you see them getting better it's you know it's like keeping in mind that i like if they can do it i can do it you know like Mm -hmm. there's nothing you know there's nothing particularly special about um like William Sensei or Kuroda Sensei, um, that like, except that they started, you know, years before I did, right? Like, mm-hmm. the Sensei started when he was five, so uh, he's going to be really good, you know. Right. I started thirty years later, you know, and so and like William Sensei, I mean, he's done like all kinds of stuff since he was, you know, I think like. Or he did wrestling and then he did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and then he did travel the world fighting, doing like MMA before MMA was a thing, you know, back in the seventies and like yada, yada, yada. Right. So it's like, you know, I think when I met him, he had been doing stuff for 40 some years, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, and you're like, knowing that it's, it's, it's an achievable thing, but it's still, yeah, there's days where I I've never been like, screw this, I'm out of here, but I've definitely, been pissed that I can't make stuff work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like uh I feel like we all have those days especially because I think um it you know you do want as a person 
to strive to be better in anything you do. And if you live by that, there's definitely going to be a lot more days than someone who doesn't. They're going to be like, why didn't I do Like, you'll be mad at yourself yeah, yeah. for it. Um, but yeah. I think it's a very good uh, philosophy to live by because um, you're just going to be bettering yourself. And when you better yourself, you're better others. Um, the other yeah, I agree. I, I agree. Yeah. The other question I have before we hit um, what you both are doing today, like in terms of teaching and how we'll get into a little more samurai stuff. What was it like? Because you mentioned your one instructor, you know, this has been in his family you mentioned for like hundreds and hundreds of years. So I'm guessing, and you can correct me that his family lineage potentially were, you know, samurai back when, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, what was it like training under someone that had that much family history going into and learning from that? Um, yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, there's definitely like a mystique part about it as mm -hmm. a student, you know, um, I mean, his, his grandfather, um, Brody Yasuji was, you know, I mean, he was around like teaching people that went off to World War II and, and, you know, I, uh, I don't recall when he was born, but I think it was like the late 1800s, um, you know, so he he was he was in that transition area era from like really the fall of the samurai and the Me you know, the end of Meiji Restoration and um, you know so so it's it wasn't even like that long ago really you know it was like 130 years ago kind of um, or 140 years ago that that like really the last of the samurai um, or maybe not even that long because like our like Yoshida Kataro and, and Takeda Sakaku were like right wing Japanese kind of right wing. I don't know that it jives with like the American version of that, but, but uh, in, in Hokkaido, Japan, like still kind of doing some of that mm -hmm. shenanigans, you know, and, and even Yoshida Kataro was off in Manchuria um, in the thirties mm -hmm. uh, doing probably working as a, an assassin or a strong man of some type, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not documented anywhere um, that, <laughs> that we know of. Out of. Yeah. Nowhere that we know of. there's, you know, there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot about it, but like from uh, Don Jay Sensei and, and then William Sensei and another guy who trained with Don Jay that lives up here, uh, Dave Slocum, you know, their research mm -hmm. um, hints at that. Um, but anyway, so, so, so like it, you know, he, like uh, Kuroda Sensei is not really, you know, he kind of, he's got this playful rascal kind of aspect about him, which, which I think it doesn't fit sort of like what we would think of a samurai as like the serious image. But I, I kind of think like most samurai mm -hmm. were, were rascals, <laughs> right? Like, you kind of you got to be kind of a, a rascal in a way to be a be a top level person that doesn't get doesn't get killed you know mm -hmm. um and and like you know he's his own person so it's it's kind of hard for me to totally answer that question but i think there's definitely like a oh there's an authentic part that or at least like a perceived authentic part as a student um and then uh but you also like you know he feels dangerous, you know. <laughs> I mean, like <laughs> there, there's a I don't know, you know, like if you've been around Pete, like there's some people where you're like, that guy seems super cool, but he like there's, you don't you want know, to mess with him. There's something about him where like there's other people that sort of act dangerous, maybe you know, but you're like, yeah, I could probably take him, mm -hmm. you know. And he's got a bit of that other one where you're like, yeah, he seems like a real sweet grandfather, but I'm pretty sure he could kill all of us. You know? <laughs> he's the um, the silent with a smile guy. on his face. Yeah, right. All wearing I a thought you were... wig. Yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> that's so. a that's pretty cool. Um, that's funny. The silent but deadly type for sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> all right, so. We covered both of your um, travel and your life learning your martial arts. 
I want to, the last section of the podcast, I want you both to go into detail about what you're learning. Well, you both are mainly teaching now, but teach, like, what are you doing now in terms of teaching others? Like what specific styles, um, if you're learning, continue to learn. And since we are talking, you know, martial arts about the samurai, what have you, what, I should word this different. What in terms of the samurai, the, their lifestyle and stuff, what did they practice, you know, on a daily basis, either if it was, you know, um, um, training, uh, their uh, beliefs, like anything, what did they do that you now implement in your daily life? I know Josh, you mentioned, we were talking about the whole, you know, perfection type of thing, but for both of you kind of, again, just every day and anything that they did that you implement now, and we'll do some questions around that type of stuff. So Ryan, you can go first. So, I mean, uh, Samurai walked around with three foot razor blades and, <laughs> and I mean, on their hips all day. So you have to kind of understand you had to be a little bit more polite about things mm -hmm. um, when there's such a, you know, uh, there's such a threat at all times. Mm -hmm. um, you can apply this to your um, daily life. Um, being kinder to people, um, you know, uh, as a teacher and what I teach my students is, um, you, you would see the implications of what this would do. Mm -hmm. Um, swords cut, they were, I mean, that's what they were made for, right? Mm -hmm. And they were only made for cutting one thing that's people. Um, so you have to it, to take on the responsibility of learning that um, it, it elevates you and makes you a, more of a uh, what, what's the word? Um, it, I mean, it would turn you into a gentle man or a gentle woman mm -hmm. um, rather than just being a Joe Schmo, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're taking a great deal of personal responsibility learning. Um, I mean, it is uh, fulfilling. Um, you, you, you actually elevate yourself. Uh, like uh, the old Japanese thing is, is polishing the mirror. You know, every day you wake up, you polish the mirror. So you, you make yourself a little bit better. Um, some days that doesn't uh, occur, but you know, you, you try like every day, a little bit, uh, sharpen the sword is another thing that they would say, you know, every day you kind of get more keen, you know, every day you, you, you strive to get a little bit better. Um, I, we went over that with, you know, what Josh was talking about in, um, mm -hmm. Japan. Um, and I mean, that's something that is uh greatly uh, uh missing from a, a lot of martial arts i think mm -hmm. is that they don't bring that up um that you should be better than you was the day before mm -hmm. um that's i mean i think uh miyamoto musashi uh famous samurai he he wrote about that um uh i mean it's all uh, how you impart, you know, how I impart my knowledge to my students is so that they're better and that I learn from them as well um, so that I get better. So I could see, uh, you know, oh, they're doing that. I better fix that and do that. And, mm -hmm. and you know, am I doing what he's doing or am, am I doing what she's doing? Because that doesn't seem right. I need to correct that. Um, so, I mean, like the saying is, when you teach, you learn twice as much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I do believe that that is a true statement. Um, I learned more from teaching students than I did as just a student. Right. And it, um, it's very interesting because 
you know, preparing for as much as I could with the time that I have preparing for this video series and the podcast, you know, people think, or the first thing they think of when they think of samurai is like, oh, they're these amazing warriors, you know, they're super deadly and stuff. But the more you learn about them, they're like, wait a minute, like they have like a way about them. They had this almost like a, I wouldn't say gentle mindset, but like how you were saying that they, since they're taking on this responsibility, they have to think more about what they're going to do, be a little kinder, almost kind of like, if you don't need to, in a sense, use what you have, then you then don't like you're prepared for it, but you know, just be a better human being, like be kind to people, you know, and everything. And I think that's people that when they think about the samurai and stuff, they don't really that's not what they immediately like connect the samurai to that mindset but after you know learning some more about their history and talking to people um like both of you and some others that instill their guidelines they're like wait no they're more they're more complex than we think and there's this whole different you know their mindset and their lifestyle and stuff I think you know can be taught and touched upon and can it work you know for during their time and it can work now also because you said like you're teaching your students it and you see them um do like actively doing what you teach them in their daily life which I think is awesome and is very relevant to today on to practice those those values and those teachings which I think is really cool um yeah I'm I'll throw in a little bit there too is the uh you know the like even like now if you go to Japan like the the regi the manners mm-hmm. are still very much prevalent you know mm-hmm. and, and um and we've i think we've lost a lot of that in the west mm-hmm. um you know but when you like ryan's saying when you're walking around with a, a 30 inch razor blade on your hip and and a lot of other people are and and you have a you know another like 18 or 12 inch razor blade accompanying that thing um, that you're you grow a system of expected etiquette and manners right so everybody can can understand you know I, th- I think like how behavior should be and then if you if you diverge from that behavior um, you're not doing something normal or expected and that is uh, probably will end in bad things happening to you um, you know, and I think in like a Western sense, like um, I haven't researched this, but like from a martial sense, it makes sense to me. Like the reason that you would take your hat off when you enter a building is because now your right hand is occupied with a hat instead of a rapier, right? So it's like there are things set in manners that show that you're not a threat to somebody, you know, mm-hmm. and the same like when you stand up when someone enters the room, you know, the Japanese had that as well. Like if you're if you stand up, you're showing respect to the person who's entering, and but you're also standing up because uh, you can't fight with a sword when you're seated, you know, mm-hmm. and be a big insult to stay seated because that's kind of a, you know, an up yours. I'm so good, I don't even need to get up, you know, like, um, so it's, it's either like a deliberate thing or, 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 or not maybe, but um, mm-hmm. definitely rude either way, you know. Um, and and the you know the, the I think the other thing that like gets into the to the life thing is like when you learn these you know when when you go from using a wooden sword to a real sword in the dojo like man your attention is like maximized you know because like I almost cut my thumb off years ago um, and I was not I wasn't messing around. I wasn't moving quickly. I felt the the tip of my sword leave my hand. I didn't feel it enter my hand. Right. So, so it's like, there's a, um, uh, you can't forget about anything because like your sword will cut anything, including your enemy and you, right. And there, there's, um, um, you know, so like, as you do that, you change how you physically move and that can't, um, I can't help but change how you mentally and, and emotionally like interact with the world, you know, like mm-hmm. start to learn how things can be dangerous and, and, and 
why manners are, are where they are and the power that you hold as a human being, I think you tend to be a little nicer yeah. to people. Um, Cause you see the consequences of things, you know, and it's like when you, when you can hide behind a keyboard, you can be real mean because nobody punched you through the computer screen. Right. So there, there is some, like some level of politeness and kindness that comes from this art, you know, and, mm-hmm. and if you look at the samurai and their like love of cherry blossoms, like, you know, one of the most delicate flowers that I know of, you know, where they, it's like they bloom. And then if there's a windstorm or rain or rain, they're like all gone, you know? So it's like they, and they love those things. So there's like an aspect of this like delicate world that they, um, they really understood, you know, kind of the fleetingness of life and the, and how delicate we are. Mm-hmm. We're tough. We're not that tough. You know? <laughs> um, it kind of also, I mean, you just said that you know, the delicateness, they understand that they're tough, but they're not that tough, I think, um, is also something that people can apply to every day. Cause like, if you kind of like walk around thinking that you're like the toughest person in the room, like that's kind of like bad energy that you're giving off, you know, you gotta kind of think about it in that delicate balance and kind of like, you know, you're, you're potentially not like, just be like trying yeah. to think equal, you know, with everyone. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think it's funny, you mentioned the whole standing up manner, um, standing up in terms of uh, how the Japanese, you know, practice it then and now, because for the military, we learn to stand up when the higher ranking comes in um, to show respect to them. Um, But now you just gave an example on how manners back then or influence some practices today i mean the military is just is a very small community so um that's not you know something that everyone knows but i definitely think you know those little things and i think it it's important too because my big thing is like if you get especially kids if you get people some people involved no matter what age they are and they you like drop these little like seeds in them like oh just do this and do that um, they're not going to know it, but I think they're going to eventually learn, like just, you're going to do it without thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And it's going to just change, you know, their lifestyle and stuff, especially kids. Cause I'm a big believer in, if you start them young, then when they get older, you know, they're going to, it's just going to be like second nature to them and stuff. But, which I think is really, it's really cool and interesting. And, um, as important to instill not only in pe- whoever you teach, but also to for the younger generation instill the whole, um, you know, politeness, the delicateness, um, like Ryan was saying, the responsibility you take on, as well mm-hmm. as being kind to others. I think that's important stuff that the samurai, you know, practice and kept in their um, for their mindset that we can implement today. Um, is there anything else that you two can think about that the samurai did that you both implement into your everyday life? Um, well, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. So the, you know, their understanding of one, like the world they were in was, you know, even though with the delicate piece, right, like there was, there was a brutality to it that we don't experience. And I think even like in the West, like wherever in the world, you know, hundred, you go back 150 years, life was a lot harder for everybody. You know, um, you get a, a splinter that you don't pull out or don't notice. And like your legs get amputated and, 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 or maybe you're going to die because no antibiotics, none of this. Right. And that's just like a, a, a low level thing. Um, <clears throat> in a sense, right? Like it's not a sword fight meaning low level, level. But um so like even in in that world, I, you know, I think a big piece um is the the samurai's um kind of like flat you know carpe diem philosophy um of like living in the now and that like their attachment to like the Zen world of of experiencing the world as it is, you know, and and um like reading different treatises and and um, 
books about Japanese culture in the past, right? Like, uh, uh, you know, in a, a samurai might, <laughs> if you ask him what, how the weather is outside or what the temperature of the water is, he might tell you like, go jump in it or go outside, you know, because <laughs> it's really like your experience that's going to tell you like my, what I think it is, is sort of irrelevant. Um, mm -hmm. And so like they had, they had that piece going on and, you know, they would think about like um, being in a sword fight should be just like eating breakfast, you know? And it's like, oh, well, eating breakfast, like no big deal. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not like worried. Am I going to like put my food? Is this fight going in my eye or is it going to go on my shirt or am I going to eat it? Like it's anyone's business, right? Like that's not how we eat breakfast. Like we know we're going to crush it, you know, there's no doubt. Um, so like, what does that mean? You know? And like, they must've, I think like really realized their, um, you know, their mortality in a way that, that made them approach life to the, to the maximum mm -hmm. that they individual, you know, like, I don't know, like, did they all, did, did they all win? Probably not. In in the sense of like, did they all embody that perfectly? Probably not, but this was like the ideal to, to go for, you know, and that, mm -hmm. like, um, taking that like to now it's like, okay, so how can I, how can I like just accept the world as it is and not be, and out of shape about it or, mm -hmm. or, um, upset about it, you know, you know, cause like that could be not helpful to me. Um, like, how am I going to do my, like, do my best today, you know? And of course, some days I'm like upset about it or whatever, but like trying to go back to the ideal of like, what am I thankful for today? What's awesome about today? I got 10 minutes of free time. I can go do some more training. I can work on my sword thing. I can spend time. I like, how the hell do I do this? Um, you know, and, 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 um, and I think they were also like, they were, they were well aware of like the mental aspects of, of things, but also the, like, you know, Japan still is a strong apprenticeship culture and that, and, and even, you know, in older times, they were even, I think, more aware of like what model behavior does, you know, and I think like you kind of touched on that, like planting a seed in a kid, you know, and, and sort of talked about it, like, oh, my student, like, why is my student doing that, you know, and he's like, because oh, I'm doing that, you know, so, and that's like how we learn as teacher, you know, like that happens to me all the time, like, what the hell's my student doing, oh, man, <laughs> I, you know, like that's not what I'm trying to show, but I must be doing a little bit of it, and they're picking up on it, even mm -hmm. though I don't want them to, you know. And so then I have to get better, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna fail my student. You know? mh mm -hmm. Um. I don't know if that answers the question. I probably no, no, it definitely you know, does. Crooked road there, but <laughs> no, it definitely <laughs> does because again, and just from conversation I've had with people who also like you both, you know, learn from not only your martial arts, but the samurai and how they lived and stuff. One thing I've, I've learned is that, you know, they, you mentioned this, they are aware that any day could possibly be their last day. So what's the point of stressing about stuff, especially stuff that's not in your control? You know, what's, what's the point, especially for the samurai who were warriors, you know, if any day was potentially their last day, cause they're going out and fighting in these battles. So what's the, what purpose does stressing about stuff that I can't control or, you know, worry about stuff that I can't control? What's, what's that going to do? You know, right. it's better to live in the moment because right. whatever moment I'm living in may potentially be my last moment. Um, which I, present. yeah, exactly. Be in the present, be in the, be in the now, um, which, you know, it's okay to, sometimes think about the future but when it comes to you know what they did and you know applying it today i think you know not stressing about s the small stuff especially and trying to live more in the now will be super beneficial just for everything for your your mindset your stress levels just like every aspect of life i think is something that they did is important or can be very useful today you know moving forward um brian did you have anything to add on to the top of what josh mentioned 
I uh, know. I think he nailed that really. Um, <laughs> it definitely. That was definitely good. <laughs> awesome. Sweet. Well, um, I'm trying to think of more questions, but we actually went a little bit over time, which I mean is okay. Cause we were kind of just flowing, you know, naturally with the podcast and stuff. Um, before we close out, uh, first I'll ask you both, is there anything that you like to add about what we discussed or anything you think we might've missed? Like this is the time now that we can, uh, talk about it. If any of you have anything else to add. Um, sure. I'll, I'll throw in a little more. Cause I, you asked a little bit more too about kind of like, I think sort of like how the different martial arts were used. Yeah. Um, and so like one thing um, <clears throat> that I, I really, I, like I've, granted I haven't like explored the world for every martial art available. Mm -hmm. um, I, I found what I like and I'm, I'm here and I'm happy. Um, uh -huh. The, <clears throat> what, you know, one, one thing that, the samurai did and is take and try to make all of their movements identical or as identical as possible. So like the uh, um, practice Ryan mentioned, um, like for his Monday night in San Diego doing Roku Giri are these six basic cuts. Mm -hmm. um, and so like the way you do the footwork for that and the way you move your body and your arms for cutting um, if you were cutting a person or a mat or whatever, will work the same. Like you, you move in the same way that if somebody grabbed your hands, you could also move their body and 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 break their posture. Um, or if they grabbed you, or you grabbed them and you wanted to throw them, that you would move, move in the same way. You know. Mm -hmm. um, so they tried to make it so there, there's no like, well, let's see if the guy had a sword or if, if I had a sword or if I had a, a staff or if I had a knife, I would do this thing or this other thing or whatever. It's like, I like, you know, and, and you'll swing by the dojo tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. You'll see a bit. Of, I'll show you this. Right. But like, if you're using a Tessin mm -hmm. or a Tato, mm -hmm. Akazashi, like you're going to use them in the same way. Uh, with the or with the same movement, right? Mm -hmm. And there's with minor adjustments um, because the length or, or what it is, right? You can't cut somebody with a tesson, so you'll have to impact them or something like mm -hmm. that. But um, but the core and core movements are the same for those, you know. So it's like kind of once once you learn a couple things, mm -hmm. um, you know, that exceptionally really good person you can extrapolate those principles into 500 techniques basically right mm -hmm. um, and doing 500 techniques is is another way to just um sort of how many scenarios can you come up with to train so you don't have to like go i've never seen this before <laughs> in a combat situation you know so like if i think if you if we think of like a a shoot house in the military right they don't just do one shoot house and go, oh, yeah, all right, I can do any shoot house now, right? Like where possible, <laughs> somebody would, would go, um, you know, especially if they know they're going to enter a building, like, hey, what's the floor plan of this building we're going to go into next week? Mm -hmm. Shoot yeah. house, stuff like that. So we're not like learning on the fly, right? We want to learn every possible scenario um, mm -hmm. available. And so, you know, whatever they do, they would do that, that kind of the same type of thing too. So like a lot of different techniques, like we have a bunch of different techniques, mm -hmm. but really that different, you know, like mm -hmm. all kind of <laughs> one, <laughs> I say like we have four, we have four or five things we do, you know, they just mm -hmm. are combined in a million different ways. Yeah. It sounds you know? like, it sounds like, it, I mean, I'll experience this, but it sounds like as a student, that's also useful because you don't have to remember like a whole bunch of stuff if a lot of um the movements transition over from one um implement to the other 
And it's funny that you mentioned actually the uh, the shoot house or when we're clearing a building, because we do have, you know, the same kind of cues or what you should do steps in certain rooms or for hallways and stuff, but not every building's going to be the same. So you'll have the stuff in mind, the same core movements, like, oh, like, for example, this is how I clear a hallway. Or this is how I clear a corner. This is how I clear a room if there's furniture in the room, right? But every, not every building is going to be the same. So just remembering those core details and how to do specific things, because you, almost every bit of building will you right. know, have a all hallway different. or a yeah. room, but they're all different. Oh, yeah, yeah. Remembering the core movements and then implementing it to the new scenario is how you'll be effective and just repeating on those core movements. And like you said, you implement them into different uh, techniques and stuff, I think is beneficial for especially for a student. That way they're not like having to remember like a whole bunch of different core movements and then it can transition over, um, which I think is is very cool. I don't think you know, in, in learning about different martial arts, that's not mainly the case, I don't think, but I'm not, you know, 100% sure, but I'm excited to, to start, see those core movements. Um, Ryan, do you have anything to add that you, off the top of your head or something that I meant, like we missed, that we mentioned or whatever, now is the time you have the floor. Uh, I don't really, I don't really have anything really. Um, I mean, yeah, the, uh, like the old thing, um, that Don had, uh, Don Anjay who taught James, um, mm -hmm. he said, I could change all the techniques. Um, I can make up a million different techniques for you to learn, but as long as the principle remained the same, mm -hmm. I would be teaching you the same art. Mm -hmm. so that's like like what you guys are talking about right now it is as long as you adhere to the principle um of what is being taught um you can do almost anything mm -hmm. right no i technique I, wise yeah i a hundred i a hundred percent agree especially since you were able both of you were able to relate it to a scenario that i've personally been in I 100% agree with that um so lastly but first of course I want to say thank you for you both for being on and talking about this topic which is very super interesting to me because again I was a martial arts kid I'm still I am I love it like I love it today to death and I want to start learning again but one thing that we like to do here is that we both or for both of you we like to ask and, and we can make it specific to martial arts if you have, you know, any goals in terms of teaching, um, learning, personal, whatever, for the rest of the year. And then also, too, um, if you have, like, social media or whatever, where the audience can find you both. Um, so I'll first start with Ryan. So what do you have goals in terms of teaching martial arts personal for the rest of the year and where can the audience find you on social media and stuff so uh i'm not i'm not big on social media okay um, but you could always uh find uh, just google samurai arts of reno mm -hmm. you can find me there if that's mm -hmm. you know if that's what you want to do <laughs> um goals for the year um wow uh, just continue to polish the mirror, make myself better <laughs> every day. I mean, that's always that's always the easy way out, right? <laughs> I mean, it's the the easy answer, but I feel like in theory, it's it. Some days are going to be harder than others to polish the mirror. It's definitely that how it is. It's definitely <laughs> the truth. Awesome. All right. Um, Josh, so how about you? Goals for the rest of the year in terms of martial arts, teaching, personal, whatever. And then where could people find you if you are on social media? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, social media. Uh, I am at uh, Seattle Samurai on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, you can. Yeah, I'm not really on Facebook anymore. Uh, and then. <laughs> satobukan.com you can contact me through through my website there which is s-a-t-o-b-u-k-a-n 
Mm-hmm. Um, and let's see, I, you know, my big, um, kind of my goal, my every year goal really with my students is, is just to grow their awareness. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think a big, a big part of this, this learning um, is, is like, if we don't, if we don't know what we don't know, we can't learn it, you know? So, so if I don't know, if I don't know what I'm doing, then you can tell me whatever, and I'm going to think I'm crushing it maybe, you know, Uh like, uh, you know, or I won't know what you're talking about. And either of those are bad. Right. So, um, so that's kind of my, that's always my goal with my students is like, just, if you can just know what you're doing, mm-hmm. like then you can, as a student, can progress. You know, because mm-hmm. um, I can show you and do all whatever all day long, but but it's you know it's really on the student to learn in spite of the teacher kind of. Mm-hmm. Um, and <clears throat> um, let's see, personally, uh, you know, I want a benefactor so I can do martial arts all day and. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see, the <laughs> sugar daddy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, let's see, kidding aside, um, or mostly kidding aside, I, um, you know, I, I think, uh, yeah, man, I don't know. Um, well, I also do, uh, 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 I do some aerobatics, so a kind of personal goal this year is to compete in three uh, aerobatic competitions. Um, oh, nice. Um, would be a, would be a <laughs> one last year that got crushed because you know the rona <laughs> oh yeah 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 for shut sure. it all down but <laughs> <laughs> that uh yeah. that would be actually really interesting to see you do some of that stuff because i think i know what you're talking about but we can uh yeah. talk about it later on but um again i like to thank you both for being on I really appreciate it. Just diving deep into this topic. Again, I'm really interested in, um, and everything, uh, for everyone out there listening. Thank you for listening. Um, like I said in the earlier in the podcast, again, this is part of our creative content or creative content for a cause this season, first season, we're helping out the Colorado veterans project. So again, all the link will be in the description below, as well as both Joshua's and Ryan's links for, you know, if you want to learn from them, because I definitely think they, just from talking to them for the past hour and a half, they are definitely amazing teachers and anyone who's interested should definitely learn from them. So I'll um, put their links down below. Again, thank you both Josh, Ryan, and everyone for listening. Follow the series until the end. You don't want to miss it. I'm Daniel Minetti, and I'll talk to all you guys next time. Bye.